Hello, everyone, and welcome to the advocacy webinar on Medicaid and Section 1115 waivers, informing the conversation from a primary care perspective. Before we start, a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. All of your lines are muted, but please type questions into the question box at any time. On the right side of the screen is the control panel. This is how you will interact with us. To open and close the control panel, click the orange arrow. Lower down in the control panel is where you can type in your questions. Feel free to type in the questions at any time. At the end of the webinar, we will address these questions in a Q&A. With that being said, I'll turn it over to Bob Hall, Director of Government Relations at the American Academy of Family Physicians, and then Kirsten Laus, Director of State Affairs at the National Association of Community Health Centers for a brief introduction. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, I'm Bob Hall. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. First off, I wanted to thank Kirsten Lausch uh, and the rest of the team at uh, the National Association of Community Health Centers, as well as our speakers, for collaborating on an excellent presentation. Before we get to the other presentations, I wanted to quickly highlight AAFP's policy on Medicaid waivers. Late last year, the AAFP joined five other frontline physician groups representing 560,000 physicians and medical students in establishing a set of joint principles on Medicaid Section 1115 waivers. We reaffirmed our support for the federal state Medicaid program and listed six principles to guide state and federal proposals for any waiver submitted to CMS for approval. First, any Section 1115 waiver should maintain or strengthen existing affordability protections and should not create barriers to care or coverage through significant out-of-pocket costs or time limits on eligibility. Second, any Section 1115 waiver should maintain or strengthen the existing benefit structure and not reduce coverage of existing benefits. Third, any Section 1115 waiver should, limit, uh, should avoid limiting any barriers to eligibility and coverage, including punitive requirements such as employment, job training, or drug testing. Fourth, any Section 1115 waiver should not prohibit a qualified provider from participating in the Medicaid program, which allows any willing provider to participate. Fifth, any Section 1115 waiver should preserve and enhance existing funding mechanisms and limit any proposals that increase cost-sharing burdens on families or providers. Waivers should, re should raise Medicaid payment rates to match those of Medicare and emphasize innovative models of healthcare delivery, such as patient-centered medical homes. Sixth and last, any Section 1115 waiver process should pr prioritize transparency, stakeholder engagement, and evaluation to properly gauge the impact of waivers on beneficiaries and providers. With that said, I'm very excited by our lineup of speakers today, including the AFP's own member, uh, Felix M. Valbuena, Jr., uh, MD from Michigan. Their experience on the policy and practice side of Medicaid and the Section 1115 waiver process will prove invaluable during this joint webinar. I'll turn it over now to Ms. Kirsten Lausch, uh, Director of State Affairs at NAC. Thank you so much, Bob. And before I go ahead and introduce our wonderful guests, um, I want to have the chance just to, to pause and also talk a little bit about NAC's Medicaid waiver principles. Now, Medicaid is the largest source of coverage for health center patients and is a pillar for health center financing. Through the work of many of you joining us on this webinar, we've seen firsthand that state Medicaid programs and health centers stand as key partners in meeting the needs of the Medicaid population and together have the opportunity to really accelerate practice innovations that enhance the health of vulnerable patients while driving cost savings and improved health outcomes. With evolving conversations in states and at CMS, NAC felt it was important to take a step back and also establish a set of principles to help inform and guide Medicaid policy and advocacy strategies to support health centers and patients, both at the national and state level. In partnership with the Primary Care Association Leadership Committee, the National Association of Community Health Centers developed a set of Medicaid waiver principles. Um, you'll see these items listed on your screen. And in addition to helping to guide NAC's work, these principles were designed to serve as a resource for state advocacy efforts written in such a manner as to be tailored and adopted by health centers and state primary care associations based on the environment and the specific needs within their state. So these principles are to mean, maintain access to federally qualified health centers, maintain coverage, access, and affordability, foster innovation, and uphold process and transparency, transparency standards. A, a copy of these principles, as well as the principles that Bob discussed from AASP, are attached as handouts. So you'll see those on the right hand of your screen, um, it, along with copies of our presenter slides. So Medicaid provides coverage for the nation's most economically disadvantaged population. And these populations are distinguished by the breadth and intensity of their health needs. 
the impact of poverty and other socioeconomic factors that may be barriers to their ability to obtain healthcare services. As state policymakers, look to leverage increased flexibility through 1115 waivers to shape their Medicaid programs, primary care providers can play a key role in forming policy conversations. NAC and AAFP are co-hosting this webinar for primary care advocates that are interested in staying informed and equipped to best engage in the changing landscape. Today we are joined by three thought leaders who will be sharing their knowledge and experiences on ongoing changes in Medicaid, how they may impact patients and the practice of primary care. First, we will hear from Sarah Rosenbaum. Sarah is the Harold and Jane Hirsch Pro Professor of Health Law and Policy and founding chair of the Department of Health Policy at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. She also holds professorship in GW's Law and Medical Schools and the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration. Next. We'll hear from Crystal Gary. Crystal is a principal at Levitt Partners and oversees the state insight practice area. In this role, she helps clients better understand policy related opportunities and risks, refine public sector business strategies, and innovate to a maximum value. She is a former deputy governor of the state of Illinois, a former state Medicaid director, HHS Region 5 director, and White House Office of Management and Budget Policy Analyst. And then also we'll um, hear from Dr. Felix Valbuena. Dr. Valbuena has been affiliated with CHAZ Center for 29 years, initially as a social worker and resident of community, um, and as a resident of the community that they serve, then as a family physician, chief medical officer, and now as the CEO. His role as a health center leader and safety net provider brings him great joy and satisfaction. Together with the CHAZ team, he provides comprehensive patient-centered primary health and wellness care to the Southwest community of Detroit. He is a tireless advocate for community health centers at the local, state, and national level. And Dr. Valbuena is contracted as an academic faculty in the Department of Family Medicine at the Henry Ford Medical Group at Henry Ford Hospital. Additionally, he serves as the clinician representative on the NAC Board of Directors, Chair of the Clinical Practice Committee, and Vice Chair of the Health Professions Education and Health Centers Task Force. Now we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Sarah. Hello. Thank you, everybody. It's great to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, it is my job to very briefly take you through um, sort of an overview of, uh, the, of the history of 1115 uh, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, why 1115 was created, uh, and also to um, give you a brief update on litigation that's now pending over uh, one subset of Medicaid 1115 projects. Um, just a note to the organizers, um, can you advance the slides because I cannot move the slide advance. Thank you. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about how the program got started. Uh, this was a provision of law that was added to the Social Security Act in 1962, so it predates Medicaid by several years, uh, and the provision was put there at the request of President Kennedy, who, recognizing the limits and constraints of existing federal social welfare programs aimed at helping families in need, sought permission from Congress, very interesting, very unique uh, kind of permission uh, that at least in social welfare law has very rarely been granted quite in this way, uh, really has no parallel, wanted permission to experiment with existing programs in order to be able to identify ways to strengthen and improve them. Uh, and so Congress enacted this experiment Mental authority in 1962, uh, and again, the purpose was to build up and strengthen programs in, in order to help families get the benefits they were entitled to get um, and strengthen their own self-sufficiency. Uh, at the time, of course, the emphasis was on things like uh, cash welfare assistance, uh, and rehabilitation services. Uh, and so 1115 existed at the time that Medicaid was enacted and Medicaid simply um, was added to the list of programs to which this experimental authority would apply. 
And by its terms, um, 1115, as I say, said, is, 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 is extremely generous uh, in the power it grants. Um, it, it basically allows the federal government, the Secretary of HHS, to undertake any experimental pilot or demonstration project, the words are the words for the secretary to define, which in the judgment of the secretary, so in the secretary's judgment, is likely to assist in promoting the objectives of, and then of course one of the one of the programs covered would be Medicaid. Um, and under this authority, when the secretary is acting under this very special authority, he has two very important powers. One is to waive requirements of the program uh, that is the subject of the experiment that normally would apply. So, for example, if there's a restriction on eligibility to only uh, parents who, who have minor children at home, um, uh, the secretary could waive that restriction in order to allow people who were not parents of minor children to get uh, to become eligible for Medicaid. Um, if there's no uh, coverage for, let's say, um, services in the community and only nursing home care, the secretary could waive the restrictions in order to allow services to be furnished in communities. Um, so he can waive restrictions in federal law. Um, and he can also use federal funding to pay for services in populations who, whose, whose assistance otherwise would fall outside the scope of the, of, 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 the, of the program. And so 1115 has been a powerhouse statute. Um, it has propelled several fundamental shifts in the Medicaid program over the years. It was the precursor to uh, the Affordable Care Act's eligibility expansions. There were uh, many states that experimented with covering low-income adults uh, uh, under Medicaid prior to the ACA. It was the means by which states experimented with um, providing services to people with very serious disabilities in home and community settings uh, at a time when Medicaid generally was pretty limited in, in the outpatient long-term services and supports it would, it would pay for. Um, and it, 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 1115 really became the way in which states moved Medicaid from an old-time fee-for-service insurance program to one that today is probably the single largest purchase of, of managed care plans out there. Um, all 1115 demonstrations, um, in theory, um, raise trade-offs. They are there are potential for great gains, like in an eligibility expansion, a managed care demonstration. Um, uh, uh, there are also some trade-offs. For example, the Affordable Care Act 1115 demonstrations that everybody on the call probably is familiar with um, gained eligibility for millions of people um, in the demonstration expansion states. But generally, that, that expansion came at some price with the introduction of restrictions that otherwise wouldn't have applied under the law. Uh, next slide. So um, one uh, subset of all the 1115 demonstrations in the world, uh, I should note that the Kaiser Family Foundation has a very nice uh, 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 1115 uh, uh, explainer. They, they do these explainers all the time and there's one that literally provides information on all types of 1115 projects, not just the expansion of the eligibility projects. Um, but one particular subset of demonstrations is what we're seeing right now. Um, and these are demonstrations that the Trump administration launched in uh, early 2018, following a long period of time um, when uh, this type of demonstration was rejected by the Obama administration. And these are demonstrations that uh, essentially add work as a condition of eligibility uh, for both newly eligible people and uh, people who are already getting benefits. 
uh, uh, if they are adults um, of working age, um, just describing the, the, the demonstration very broadly, each state has its own variation. So if they are adults of working age, um, they are now required to demonstrate a minimum level of work in order to receive their benefits. Uh, generally, the work is half time every week with maybe 50 weeks out of 52 weeks in a year uh, with periodic updating of their work status, um, uh, new reporting requirements. Um, generally, these kinds of work rules are accompanied by other changes, um, changes in premium payments, um, changes in benefit packages. In the case of Kentucky, Kentucky is also testing, uh, introducing what, what the secretary ca has called commercial insurance principles into Medicaid, which means if you don't pay a premium or you don't report information like you're supposed to, you don't simply lose your coverage for, you know, until you come back into compliance, you are locked out of the program for a period of time. So essentially, uh, eliminating one of Medicaid's core features, which is the ability, if you're eligible, to get benefits when you need the benefits. Uh, uh, these kinds of changes have not the work requirements, the lockouts, the premiums, um, have some precedent in what the Obama administration um, uh, approved. Uh, the Trump administration has taken matters a step further by uh, strengthening those requirements and now by adding in uh, work as a requirement. Uh, as of today, um, we have approvals. I know this is something that uh, we'll go into in a bit, but there are approvals in several states, many more states pending that will be covered. And what happened in the face of this um, uh, willingness to add work as a condition of eligibility was that a group of Kentucky residents sued HHS, sued the Trump administration, um, uh, both to stop the Kentucky demonstration, but more significantly, to have the entire work initiative declared unlawful under 1115. So where we are today um, is that here, pending in federal court in Washington, D.C., is a lawsuit um, called Stewart versus Azar. Um, I've posted blogs at Health Affairs about the lawsuit. There are other blogs up, the National Health Law Program blogs on this case. Um, uh, Kaiser has blogged on this case. Uh, and um, what Stuart VA's our claims is that the secretary essentially has pushed beyond the outer limits of power under 1115 because these demonstrations do not meet the core 1115 test of promoting Medicaid's objectives. In fact, they do the opposite according to the uh, lawsuit. They, they literally put up barriers so that people cannot get the coverage they're, they're entitled to receive. Um, the plaintiffs filed their suit in January. They have moved now for um, what's called a summary judgment, that is for the federal court to declare that, the, that these work demonstrations are unlawful. Uh, the defendants um, have now counterclaimed uh, to dismiss the case, saying that they acted well within their authority to act. Um, the oral arguments happen in Stewart in in uh, in June, and a decision could come shortly thereafter. And maybe during the Q and A, we can talk a little bit more about the implications if if in fact the court finds that the work demonstrations violate 11:15. So why don't I stop there? All right. Great, so this is Crystal Gary, and I have been asked to go a little bit deeper on uh, what Sarah just shared and um, talk about uh, what's happening with Medicaid and 1115 waivers at the state and what the current trends are. Um, and at Levitt Partners, we do track state activity, including waivers, very closely. Um, and last year, there was really a slowdown in state activity as states waited for clarity on the Trump administration's waiver strategy and priorities. And then beginning last fall, we saw the administration really start to take a, a very strong stand and provide clearer guidance on what its policy direction was going to be. And then this year, uh, so far, we've really seen a number of states uh, responding to that. And the priorities that the Trump administration has set forth really fall into three main buckets. Uh, they 
reduce Medicaid's role in covering the able-bodied working age population, uh, reduce administrative and regulatory burden on providers, and then to increase transparency and particularly tr price transparency and value. And what's driving this is on one side that pressure remains very high to address the cost of Medicaid at both the federal and state levels. Um, and that's even more so than cost growth in other areas of healthcare. And then on the other side, you have the ideology of the Trump administration and his base which really favors a smaller role for government and fewer regulations. And so what we're seeing is that HHS is uh, looking much more likely to grant additional flexibility to states under that 1115 authority to implement program changes that will address both those cost concerns and the ideological preferences. So next slide. And here we have some examples of what that looks like. So previous administrations, particularly the Obama administration, would have had a lot more red X's in these boxes. Um, but today, what we see is that the administration is really starting to push the boundaries of what flexibilities they believe can be approved while still promoting the objectives of the program. Um, and so that includes, you know, some of the boxes that you see on this list. The, the one X that you now, well, there's two now, but, but that one of the X's you see is uh, additional funding for um, this disrupt, which is basically the, the flexibility and spending for delivery system reforms. Um, the checks that you see are the administration really um, allowing such things as, uh, as waiving retroactive coverage, um, requiring premiums or cost sharing up for people below 100% of the poverty level, lockout periods, work requirements. And um, some of the pending waivers out there, one of the other X you see on this slide uh, is lifetime limits. And really just yesterday, CMS denied Kansas' uh, proposal to impose enrollment time limits, uh, which makes it likely that they will be um, denying that for other states as well, which is um, a very interesting development. And then you have some waiver proposals out there uh, where states are pursuing enrollment caps and closed formularies. And there's a question mark as to what uh, the administration is, is going to do with those provisions. But that's just a snapshot of, of what some waiver activity is uh, happening out there right now. Next slide. And all of this demonstrates a significant change in direction for CMS that really has significant implications for Medicaid beneficiaries and the providers that serve them. CMS Administrator Seema Verma has expressed that priority, as I mentioned, to move the Medicaid program away from being a tool to expand coverage, and particularly coverage for the low-income, working-age, non-disabled adults, and bring the focus uh, back to seniors, pregnant mothers, children, and people with disabilities uh, that this administration views to be the core mission of the program. And they are actively encouraging states to move in that direction. So next slide. And as we can see, the states have responded. So we currently have um, seven states that have approved waivers um, that impose some form of eligibility limitation. And this slide is actually, as of yesterday, out of date um, because New Hampshire recently received uh, its waiver approval. And we have 10 states that have pending or draft waivers out there, and then 14 states that we're watching that have passed legislation or seem to be making other significant moves toward pursuing a waiver. So we can see that this is definitely gaining some momentum. Now, these eligibility limitations have primarily uh, been work requirements, lockout periods, and lifetime eligibility limits. But they're things that are expected to create new barriers to health coverage for patients, to decrease the number of Medicaid enrollees and would likely increase the number of um, patients who are uninsured. Oh, next slide. So, so far we have Kentucky, Indiana, Arkansas, and most recently New Hampshire that have received approval to impose work requirements as a condition of Medicaid eligibility, um, with several other states pursuing those requirements such as Arizona, Maine, Mississippi, North Carolina, Utah, and Wisconsin. And as Sarah mentioned, other, under these programs, enrollees would have to engage in approved activities for a minimum number of hours a month, which is generally falling in the 80 to 100 hours a month range. Um, and those 
approved activities vary by state, but they generally include either subsidized or unsubsidized employment, vocational training, um, or some other type of community or public service. And the waivers include exemptions for certain individuals, and we don't yet have a lot of specific details about what populations and states will qualify for an exemption under these programs, but we expect that they would include pregnant women, the medically frail, in some cases caregivers of disabled uh, dependents, and, and people who have serious illness. And in order to demonstrate their compliance with the work requirements, the enrollees will be subject to new digital reporting requirements. Um, and we're, we have concern that those may uh, be difficult for many low-income vulnerable uh, populations to meet. Now, the administration has indicated that they will not just rubber stamp these work requirement waivers, um, particularly in non-expansion states um, that want to impose these work requirements. They will need to demonstrate that they are, are um, taking steps to avoid a subsidy cliff within the exchanges, and um, states have to meet readiness criteria before they can move forward to implement the requirements. Next slide. So other limitations that are being pursued are lockouts, lifetime limits, and drug screenings. And so under these, enrollees who fail to comply with any of the new provisions, such as premium payments, timely eligibility renewals, getting their paperwork in on time, or those reporting requirements, will be locked out from Medicaid. And as Sarah mentioned, this is under the um, idea of, of making Medicaid more like a, a commercial insurance market. Beneficiaries would have the opportunity to reactivate their eligibility or to re-enroll by either um, satisfying the requirement, demonstrating that they meet an exemption qualification, or becoming eligible for Medicaid under a different exempt eligibility category. Now, we know that a number of Medicaid enrollees in expansion states were incentivized to enroll under that expansion category because it was generally just a much easier application process than having to go through the the more extensive disability determination process. Um, we think that these work requirements may actually push more people who might qualify under disability to actually start moving through that application process and so that they can be exempt from the work requirement. Um, and that is much more onerous for both applicants and for states. And um, so we, we expect that to have an administrative burden on states as well. Now for time limits, there are several states that um, were also actually pursuing time limits. Uh, given CMS's action against Kansas's um, application, uh, we think that it's, it's less likely that those will move forward, and that's encouraging for those who have followed the impact of lifetime limits on the TANF program, temporary assistance for needy families. And then drug screening. Um, so right now, Wisconsin uh, is the only state that is pursuing this, but they do have a waiver out there that would require drug screening and testing as a condition of Medicaid eligibility. And their rationale is that this would help them better identify individuals that have unmet substance use disorder needs and connect them with appropriate treatment. Next slide. So we're also analyzing what we think the, the potential impact of this will be. Um, and we have experience with work requirements and lifetime limits through the um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and the TANF program, which really gives us insight into the potential impact of these provisions on the Medicaid population. Uh, we know that it will be administratively complex and costly that monitoring the compliance uh, will create significant additional costs for state agencies, Medicaid managed care organizations, and likely for providers. It's unlikely that states have the adequate infrastructure to manage the increased reporting requirements and the increased redetermination ca uh, caseloads. And so it will be likely that resources will be diverted within the Medicaid program to administration in order to build out that infrastructure. And it also increases the likelihood that individuals may lose eligibility. Um, and then it will probably take longer for that eligib eligibility to be reinstated uh, once that happens. Now, the Kaiser Family Foundation has estimated that only about 7% of the Medicaid population would be required to comply with work requirements. Um, in Kentucky, the waiver application, they projected that the requirement would reduce the number of enrollees by about 95,000, 
and would reduce Medicaid spending by $2.5 billion over five years. But these requirements also impose a burden on the individuals that are not going to be subject to them because they have to actually prove that they're exempt. Um, and so there's a concern that many of those may lose eligibility due to the reporting requirements or reporting errors, uh, even if you know, they, they could qualify for an exemption um, once that's clarified. And even for beneficiaries who do seek to comply with these requirements, they will likely face barriers to meeting them. Um, in most states, between 70 and 80% of Medicaid beneficiaries do work, at least part-time, but they are low-wage workers um, that are often underemployed, um, and they have employment with fluctuating schedules that they're not always able to control, so they may not be able to ensure on their own that they meet the minimum hourly requirements. And then they may have unreliable access to computers and internet access to comply with those digital reporting requirements. And then finally on this slide, the, the loss of access and continuity of care is also an area of concern. Um, it is expected to increase that churn in the Medicaid program, which means the, the number of people who come off and, and on the program multiple times within a year. Uh, and that means a loss of continuity of care and um, possibly a reduction in health outcomes. And then that has implications for providers whose patients are disproportionately impacted by these requirements. Um, so the safety net providers who um, have a high Medicaid caseload. They will see a need to verify eligibility and lockout status, and that's particularly important in the states that are also seeking to eliminate retroactive eligibility. Possibly see an increase in the number of uninsured patients and a reduction in their Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, you know, again, that uh, Kentucky estimate that it would reduce Medicaid spending by $2.5 billion is primarily coming out of, um, out of care and experience lower quality indicators if patients are discouraged from seeking care due to that, a loss of their Medicaid eligibility. So next slide. Now the good news, and there is some good news, is that there are ways to mitigate the impact of these policies. Uh, Sarah mentioned that um, these, the legality of these have been challenged, and so uh, people will be watching uh, the outcome of, of those lawsuits. But even in states where uh, the momentum is, is there and um, these policies are expected to move forward, there are opportunities to weigh in on some of the details of how these programs are ultimately designed and implemented. And so one is to advocate for broader definitions for that exempted population. Many adult Medicaid enrollees aren't working because they have a chronic condition or are caring for a family member or somebody who's, who's in school. So, you know, again, 70 to 80% of Medicaid beneficiaries are working. The ones who aren't, uh, there's generally a reason. Um, you know, two thirds report a chronic physical illness, 35% um, report a mental illness, um, a number, you know, speak to having caregiving responsibilities, and so those are, are things that can be taken into account in designing these policies. So advocate for including those um, criteria, such as uh, severe depression, mental illness, uh, chronic conditions, caregiving uh, as exem ex uh, qualified exemptions. And then also there is an opportunity to have an economic condition exemption for, for some of these policies. So for individuals who live in communities or neighborhoods that um, face disproportionate barriers to employment, making sure that these policies uh, are looking at economic conditions at a zip code or neighborhood level versus um, a county-wide level could be very helpful in, in making sure that those individuals aren't disproportionately impacted. And then you can consider the role that providers and health centers can help play in, um, in making sure that patients uh, aren't subject to lockouts. Um, Educating policymakers and others about the fact that the vast majority of Medicaid enrollees are working or seeking work. And so for those who aren't, it's really more about identifying and addressing the barriers that they face rather than imposing a new requirement that um, they've, they likely have demonstrated can't be met. Addressing barriers to meeting those digital reporting requirements. Uh, so, you know, there's a possibility of, of making um, internet access or making a computer available to allow patients that don't 
have that access elsewhere to, um, to do that reporting and helping them to navigate those multiple systems. Encouraging patients to apply for Medicaid under that a different eligibility category if you as, as their physician um, think they may qualify. And then advocating for evidence-based alternatives. And I, you know, I'll mention the Wisconsin waiver for drug screening. Um, an alternative would uh, potentially be the West Virginia Substance Use Disorder Waiver, uh, which seeks to expand the benefit for substance use disorders and covers a full continuum of treatment. Um, and so focusing on improving access and reducing stigma rather than imposing requirements that could be seen as punitive and create a disincentive for people to um, apply and continue in, in Medicaid coverage. Next slide. And so that's all for my portion. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to start by uh, thanking uh, NAC and the AAFP for inviting me to participate in this very important uh, topic webinar today. And I especially want to thank Ryan Grinnell from the Michigan Primary Care Association for his support in putting uh, materials together for today. So my job today is going to uh, be to emphasize the importance of engagement um, in advocacy from the front lines and to give the Michigan example. Uh, the voice of the clinician that brings the experience of daily work with the community is extremely important for decision makers as an additional piece of data to be used in making an informed decision. Many providers tell me that they're too busy seeing patients and keeping up with benchmarks set for them to have time for advocacy work. My answer to that is this is an important part of your work. Next slide. Why? Because as a clinician, you can and should use your voice to advocate for support of proposed policy changes included in waivers, but even more importantly, using your clinical expertise to document the concerns about proposed policies, how that implementation will affect your practice, and how the policies will impact your patients. Policymakers need your input, as many do not have the hands-on ground-level experience related to the impact their policies have on individuals that operationalize the proposed policies or programs. The ever-changing healthcare environment needs to be influenced by the experts in the field. How? So how do we do this? As much as possible, stay current with news on the changing healthcare landscape. Uh, you know, change happens rapidly, especially during times of transition with uh, administrations. This will help prepare you for offering feedback through the public comment period. Um, this would be also through professional associations such as NAC, the AAFP, uh, Michigan Primary Care Association. They help Help us summarize and provide templates that make advocacy much easier. And then we should provide feedback to, to our association colleagues to help develop um, the best advocacy strategy. And we have to make sure that we're submitting comments when asked. So understanding busy schedules and priorities as a provider and sometimes as a provider slash administrator in my case, uh, many associations will limit the number of times they ask you to take action if you submit your own copy of comments. If you get a request, make sure you take action as it's very important. And as a reminder, don't take it personal when policymakers do not change policy based on your comments. Um, and finally, during waiver implementation, stakeholders should be in constant communication with policymakers and agencies offering feedback. Next slide. So looking at uh, Michigan, Michigan expanded Medicaid under the ACA using an uh, 1115 waiver to implement consumer cost sharing provisions. The Michigan statute authorizing the Healthy Michigan Michigan plan, which is our, our version of Medicaid expansion, required the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services as a part of the waiver to seek approval for higher levels of cost sharing than was federally allowed. The statute also contains a provision triggering the termination of the Healthy Michigan plan under certain, certain circumstances. If CMS did not approve the waiver, the Medicaid expansion would have ended. Many, many stakeholders worked together to identify problem areas and created templates specific to our constituencies to submit comments that shared generally unified messaging to ensure the administrative record, both at the state as well as the federal level, documented our concerns as well as proposed solutions of the issues identified in our comments. And ultimately, um, the CMS approval generally took into consideration the concerns of the stakeholders, which allowed for the program to continue, but also met uh, statutory requirements. Uh, some other forums, uh, public or otherwise, to offer comments or feedback um, would be, for example, uh, Michigan has a statutorily required Medical Care Advisory Council, which advises the Medicaid director. And many key stakeholder associations have a seat at that table uh, and can use that as a forum to provide feedback or constructive criticism and have it documented in the meeting minute. In Michigan, MDHHS also often holds public forums for stakeholders 
speakers to provide comment when waiver applications are being developed and submitted. And note that at its very core, and this has already been mentioned today, waivers are experimental, so they should have an evaluation element on how it is carried out. And don't forget to advocate for how this research element can be used to demonstrate the effectiveness of policies and programs. Next slide. Currently, legislation in Michigan is making its way um, through the legislature, seeking to impose work requirements as a condition of Medicaid eligibility. The current language would affect non-disabled, non-pregnant adults ages 19 through 64 and require at least 29 hours of work, education, or job training per week. Through working with MPCA, community health centers have weighed in asking for changes to the bill to lessen the impact on our patients and our communities. MPCA has worked with a broad stakeholder group to advocate for a variety of exemptions, many of which have been included in addition to the disabled adults, elderly, uh, pregnant women. And they include but are not limited to individuals that are deemed medically frail, individuals in substance use disorders treatment programs, caretakers of children under the age of six, caretakers of disabled individuals, and full-time students, including post-secondary, whose parents are eligible for Medicaid. Advocacy has also pushed for more data related to the potential impact, including the estimated number of affected individuals and the administrative costs. And uh, MPCA members and their staff have been consulted to ensure that we seek the right changes to a bill that appears to be poised to pass regardless of the position from the major healthcare uh, industry stakeholders in the state. Um, the University of Michigan has an Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, the IHPI, um, that has been contracted by MDHHS to evaluate the Healthy Michigan Plan impact on the health of Michiganders and the state's healthcare system. Next slide. And here's uh, some data. Um, they carried out, uh, the IHPI carried out an analysis um, of the proposed um, work requirement from a detailed survey they did in 2016 of more than 4,000 individuals that are currently enrolled in the Healthy Michigan Plan for more than a year. And in all, um, almost 50% of those responded said they were employed or self-employed full or part-time, though their incomes were all below 133% of the federal poverty level, about 15,800 for an individual and 32,300 for a family of four. Uh, a little under 28% were out of work in a state that in 2016 was around the national average for unemployment after a decade and a half of above average unemployment. Of these that were out of work, one third said they were in fair or poor health, and that's compared with 19% of those who said they were employed. Um, two thirds of those out of work said they had a chronic physical illness, and 35% said they had been diagnosed with a mental illness. One quarter of those out of work said that they had a physical or mental impairment that interfered with their ability to function at least half the days in the last month. A little over 11% said they were unable to work, and of these, 73.4% reported being in fair or poor health. 2.5% said they were retired, 5.2% said they were students, 4.5% said they were homemakers. Although the U of M team did not ask about respondents' roles as caregivers uh, for other household members and how that may limit their ability to work, they did include these questions in their 2017 version of the survey, which was just completed. Respondents who had a mental health condition that limited their ability to function were twice as likely to say they were out of work than those without. And other factors that were associated with individuals being significantly more likely to say they were not working were being in their 50s or early 60s, being male, or being in fair or poor health overall. It was noted that survey respondents who said they were employed or self-employed may have enrolled in the Healthy Michigan Plan because many low-wage and part-time jobs do not offer health insurance. Employers are not required, as we know, to offer health insurance if they have less than 50 workers, nor do they have to offer it to any employees who work 30 hours or less a week under the ACA. Finally, remember that, and this is a quote from the IHPA, Medicaid expansion was designed to cover those who have a gap in their coverage or jobs that don't offer insurance, but don't pay enough to allow someone to afford individual coverage. And states considering work requirements should evaluate uh, their potential impact on individuals and the potential return on expenditures required for enforcement. Um, next slide. And that's it. I'll turn okay. it back to our. Thank you so much to, to Dr. Valbuena. 
and to Crystal and Sarah. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with all of us today. And we're going to go ahead and invite folks to enter your questions into the chat box. And we have a couple that have come in. I think the first one here looks like it's um, for Crystal and Sarah. Uh, so, Crystal, if you, I, I don't know if you want to take the first stab and then Sarah, but um, this sure. question that makes sense. Says, yeah. so, um, they say, can you speak to the possibility of exempting former foster care youth from the work requirement? Yeah, this is uh, Crystal, and um, I I think that that is a very valid idea and something that is is worth advocating for. It it is an exemption that um, that a state could choose to make. Yes, and I believe I believe Kentucky did, did so, um, uh, but not all not not all the demonstration states. I think um, it may be that Kaiser in its 1115, sure they make many, many charts, um, uh, have, have charted, has charted which states have sought foster care exemption, former foster care exemptions, and I believe Kentucky's approval comes with a former foster care exemption. Great, thank you so much. And I, we're also seeing a, a chat in here um, from Ryan Grinnell in Michigan, so one of Dr. Valbuena's uh, colleagues that saying they also have a current exemption within the Michigan proposed legislation around former foster youth. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for that, Ryan. Um, we're also um, we're hearing let's see from some folks in Arizona. Their question is: um, I am from Arizona, and the state Medicaid department has not imposed the waiver. If Arizona has approval, can they impose the waiver at any time? Crystal or Sarah? I'm sorry, can you just repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, they're, um, they're saying that the state of Arizona um, has not imposed, a, uh, has not received approval yet for their waiver, but when they do, are they able to uh, impose that at any time? It, yeah, I mean, it depends. Typically, they would have negotiated, I believe, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Crystal, one of the things they would have negotiated would have been the start date. Um, so, for example, Indiana is moving to phase in relatively slowly. Arkansas is uh, theoretically poised to start in about 20 days now. Kentucky is, is supposed to start phasing in over the summer. So these states would, would be choosing dates that they think that they can, you know, meet while at the same time uh, undergoing any of the uh, final clearance steps that CMS might require before they go live. Yes, that's right. And uh, and New Hampshire, I believe, in their recent approval um, has an implementation target of January of 2019. Uh, so right. it's it's not that the state can just impose it at any time. There there will be some phase in time, um, and there are certain. There'll be certain milestones that they'll have to meet in order to demonstrate to CMS that they are ready to implement. Right, and that's just, that for any kind of demonstration, generally CMS would keep a relatively close hold on how the process moves forward. Great, thank you both. Um, so we're seeing another, I, this one is for Crystal. Um, so the question is, Illinois received notice of its 1115 waiver on May 7th. It is a waiver to work on behavioral health homes. Ms. Gary was in Illinois when it was first developed about five years ago. Any comments on these types of waivers and likelihood for more? Yeah, so um, actually this is, a, uh, a different waiver than the one that uh, was submitted because there, there's a new administration now and um, uh, the waiver that I um, had worked on when I was in Illinois uh, was revamped by the current administration um, and submitted in a different form. Uh, having said that, there are some similar principles. This waiver is, is much more uh, targeted and it's targeted specifically to behavioral health and, and there are, are definite benefits to that. Uh, and does um, 
envision uh, implementing a series of, of, I think, 10 demonstration projects. So I did find it, I have been tracking this, I did find it very interesting and encouraging that CMS did approve this this waiver. There had been some questions in, um, in my mind and others' minds as to whether uh, this, uh, uh, the Trump administration would be approving um, more of, of these types of delivery system uh, waivers, and uh, it's it's good to see that um, at least in this case and in the way that they've negotiated the structure of this, that those types of investments will still be able to be made by states. I hope that answers the question. Oh, thank you so much. That's really helpful, Crystal. Um, I, for folks that are Joining us, feel free to continue to enter your questions into the chat box. I know we received um, a number of folks were interested in the University of Michigan study out of their, their institute, out of IHPI, about the work within Medicaid. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and put that into the chat box. If you want to um, feel free to access that. Um, uh, there's a, some great pieces. It's um, an article within JAMA is where it was published. Um, and so going back to the questions, we have um, one, oh, and we did get a comment, Crystal, saying that was very helpful. So yeah, you appeared to answer their question, so thank you. Okay, good. And um, our next question here is, let's see, um, so questions about both Medicaid expansion and work requirements occurring at the same time. Um, so we're hearing a number of states where Medicaid expansion is being considered such as in Virginia, and work requirements are a big part of that conversation. Do you see waivers to expand Medicaid that include work requirements being approved? Yeah, so this is Crystal, and um, yes, uh, you know, that's that's an interesting trend. It's, it's one that's also been noted by the National Association of Medicaid Directors. Um, you know, that uh, Medicaid expansion had been controversial in many states, uh, and under the previous uh, Obama administration, um, you know, really uh, was not very open to limitations on expansion. And I think states are, are now uh, encouraged, some states, some more conservative states are encouraged that they might be able to expand Medicaid uh, with some, some more, uh, in a more targeted way. And we are seeing some interest in doing that. So I, I would not be surprised if we saw some more states that looked to uh, expand their programs with uh, some of these criteria in place to make it more politically palatable. Well, the other thing that's worth noting is that the other day, um, CMS Administrator Seema Verma um, appeared to raise some concern, not, not clear, but did seem to be raising some concerns about work requirements in non-expansion states because if the work requirements succeed the way CMS thinks they will uh, in, in raising job prospects and improving wages, um, but not necessarily getting people health insurance coverage, uh, in a non-expansion state, the penalty for going Going back to work, of course, is the loss of coverage with no way to get access to insurance until your income reaches the marketplace uh, subsidy threshold. And to that end, you know, it, it, the, the, her remarks seem to suggest that the uh, administration was not particularly interested. Maybe, maybe this is over reading what she was saying, but didn't seem so interested in work requirements that were not coupled with an expansion. Uh, because, of course, if you follow the logic of their thinking that this will make you better off, uh, it's hardly better off to go back to work only to discover that you've now lost all your insurance coverage. So, Thank you. Um, it looks like uh, one of our last questions here is about retroactive eligibility. And so the question is, one change in many 1115 waiver requests is restricting the 90-day look back for Medicaid. This may be hurtful to health centers that apply to clients for Medicaid. Can you explain this to the participants of the what, what these look, kind of retroactive eligibility proposals are and how they would impact patients and providers? 
I'm really glad this question came up. This has been a very overlooked part of uh, these proposals. I actually did a short blog for Commonwealth on retroactive eligibility and, and Kaiser, again, Kaiser Family Foundation has put out a longer, nice explainer on retroactive eligibility. Um, so this has been a cardinal rule of Medicaid for almost as long as the program has existed, not quite, but almost, that that allows people who are found eligible to actually roll back the date of eligibility by three months. And of course, there's no, so literally you're eligible prior to the date you apply. There's no better exemplar of Medicaid as a safety net program than an insurance plan that lets you literally start your coverage before you were even found eligible formally. Most, most of the time insurance starts the month after you're found eligible just to, you know, to avoid things like getting benefits when, when you need health care, which would be a big adverse selection problem. So Medicaid has had this characteristic for a long time, and Commonwealth did a report um, last year. Uh, in the report, which was on safety net hospitals, Commonwealth reported that 5% of the operating revenue of very high dish hospitals, uh, so the guys who take care of a lot of low income patients, 5% of their operating revenue comes from retroactive eligibility payments. And it makes sense, you know, a previous, an uninsured person is brought to the emergency department with a, with a, a huge injury and is found eligible on a retroactive basis. Um, uh, and, uh, coverage then covers the medical bills. So it's a way to bar it's a way to encourage providers not to turn people away, and it's also a way to make sure that they're not stuck with huge bills. The logic behind the waivers, as it has been explained to me, um, is that this is not a feature of the commercial insurance market, and states don't want it to be a feature of Medicaid. Um, I've been shocked, quite frankly, Given how important retroactive eligibility is for nursing home care, I, got, I always waived it for, for the, its entire population. It's particularly important for hospital care, for long-term care. Um, I have been amazed at the number of states that have sought and obtained retroactive eligibility waivers, and it's by no means limited to this, to this administration. The Obama administration has waived it as well. And I, we, uh, several of us very interested in this have tried to find people who are actually doing some empirical research uh, on the financial impact of waiving retroactive eligibility. So far, we have not found any, but you would think it's a huge issue in long-term care and catastrophic emergency department services. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think hearing more about the retroactive eligibility is very helpful and really important. And again, I would just remind folks, Sarah has a great blog about this and encourage you to check that out as well. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague Eric at AFP. Well, that concludes today's webinar. Thanks to all the speakers for their great presentations and answers to the questions. Uh, for all those listening in today, you'll see a short survey upon exiting the webinar, and we really greatly appreciate your feedback uh, to improve future webinars. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.